Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 14 through 29. The background for verse 14 is obviously the ministry of Jesus Christ with its miracles and teaching. And we read, King Herod heard of it. For his name had become well known, and people were saying, John the Baptist has risen from the dead, and that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others were saying, he is Elijah, and others were saying, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he kept saying, John, whom I beheaded, has risen. For Herod himself had sent and had John arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death and could not do so. For Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was very perplexed, but he used to enjoy listening to him. A strategic day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his lords and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias herself came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you want, and I will give it to you. And he swore to her, Whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately, she came in a hurry to the king and asked, saying, What I want you to give me at once is the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And although the king was very sorry, yet because of his oath and because of his dinner guests, he was unwilling to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded him to bring back his head. And he went and had him beheaded in the prison, and brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about this, they came and took away his body and laid it in a tomb. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's pray. The old Puritan John Owen gave some sober counsel when he wrote, Be killing sin, or it will be killing you. That's stern advice, but we ignore it at our peril. Mark 6 gives an example of a man who had a sin that he would not kill. The result was he killed a prophet. And that murder paved the path to his own destruction. Mark 6, 14 through 29, recounts one of the most shocking stories in the Bible, the beheading of John the Baptist. It is macabre, severing the prophet's head and serving it up on a platter. But as ghastly as it is, it is also an event filled with lessons like some out of the book of Proverbs and Solomon's stories about the fool. Solomon wrote, wine is a mocker. That's here. He wrote, there is one who speaks rashly like the thrusts of a sword. That's here. Pride goes before destruction. That, maybe most of all, is here. Now Mark didn't write this account to be a proverb. He wrote to explain why King Herod feared Jesus. 
but it contains lessons and it contains warnings for our own lives. And one of the main lessons that it gives is not really found in Herod's folly, but in John's courage. His life and his end foreshadowed that of Christ and that of the Lord's disciples. Through persecution, he was a model for each one of them. Jesus has told parables that forewarn the disciples of hazards in the ministry. The parables of the soils showed that the gospel would be rejected by many. And of course, the implication of that is the preacher of the gospel will re be rejected by many. Jesus was just rejected in Nazareth. They, the disciples, can expect the same. He said, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. Now we read of a prophet who was murdered. Jesus' ministry in Galilee with its large crowds and miracles had made him a celebrity. The religious leaders knew about him early on from the very beginning, but only later did the politicians learn of him. That's when our passage begins, and King Herod heard of it. He heard of the Lord's ministry long after it began and was thriving. And I think that tells us a lot about that man's spiritual condition. Jesus, the person his father, Herod the Great, had tried to murder, the one the wise men had called the king of the Jews, Jesus was in the region that Herod ruled. And only now, many months later, he learns of it. He was a spiritually dull man. But now that the news had caught up with him, what he heard scared him. He heard the opinions people gave to explain who the Lord was. Some were saying he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. Others were more specific. He is Elijah. Elijah had done miracles and, as you know, was taken up into heaven in a chariot of fire, so they thought he's returned to the earth. Others gave a different name, a contemporary one. John the Baptist has risen from the dead, and that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. Well, that's the explanation that scared Herod. And that's the one he believed. He kept saying, I notice that he kept saying over and over again, John, whom I beheaded, has risen. He was convinced of it. He wasn't convinced of it because of the miracles. He was convinced of it because of his conscience. It was accusing him. And he thought that John had returned from the dead to haunt him. So the next verses are, are a flashback in which Mark explains why Herod was so troubled, what happened to John and why it happened. The explanation involved members of Herod's family, his wife, his daughter, and the public scandal of his marriage. It also involved the courage of John. Old Testament prophets had to be brave because they had to speak truth to power. That's never easy. It could result in persecution, and it usually did. Jeremiah was threatened. Jeremiah was put in the stocks. Jeremiah was dropped down a well. In the days of Ahab and Jezebel, the prophets of God were hunted down. Elijah was made to live a fugitive's life. In fact, there is a striking similarity here between Elijah, Ahab, and Jezebel, and John, Herod, and his queen, Herodias. Just as Jezebel was after Elijah, Herodias was after John. He had told Herod that his marriage to Herodias was illegitimate. He couldn't be married to her. It was an immoral relationship, and she hated him for it. After all, he put her in the, in the eye of a public scandal. Well, the history behind all of this has its origin in Herod and Herodias' lust for one another. 
When his wicked father finally died, Rome, which ruled the world, divided the kingdom among Herod the Great's sons. Herod Antipas is the king of this chapter, the Herod of this chapter, the son of Herod the Great. Herod Antipas was given Galilee and Perea. Now, Perea was a region east of the Jordan River, south of the Sea of Galilee, and east of the Dead Sea. Herod was called king, probably as a local custom, but he was actually technically a tetrarch, which means he ruled a part of a domain under the authority of the Romans. Hardly a king, a petty ruler. He had a brother named Philip who lived in Rome. Herodias was Philip's wife. On a visit there, Herod seduced her and persuaded her to leave her brother and marry him. She agreed. Herod was himself married, but he was ruled by his passions and quickly divorced his wife without cause and married his brother's wife. The marriage was illegal for a Jew. The law of Moses prohibited a man from marrying his sister-in-law. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 21 calls such a marriage an act of impurity. Still, that's what he chose to do. And the decision he made to break the law and pursue his lust rather than to control it, rather than to kill it, had repercussions. It always has repercussions. Repercussions throughout his life. That's why we see so much of the Proverbs here. Selfish decisions, personal indiscretion, lack of discipline, sin, always have consequences that ripple across a man's life to the end. Proverbs 6.23 says, A man who commits adultery will destroy himself. The Proverbs are, Proverbs are filled with such warnings. Guard your heart over and over, we're told to do that. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Herod didn't. And that gives the details of verses 17 and 18. On account of Herodias, due to her hatred of John, Herod arrested the prophet, bound him, and put him in prison. Again, that was the life of a prophet. They were God's mouthpiece. They spoke truth. They spoke His truth, His revelation, but men don't want that. And John put it very plainly in John chapter 3. Men love the darkness rather than the light. They always have. That's a fallen world and a fallen mankind. Men love the darkness rather than the light. Herodias did, and she bore a grudge. That's what Mark says. So, just as Jezebel hated Elijah and wanted him dead, Herodias hated John and wanted him dead. But Herod wouldn't allow it. Mark says Herod knew John was a righteous and holy man, and he was afraid of him. The old commentator H.B. Sweet said that he feared him as the bad fear the good. Well, that's true. Matthew, though, adds a little more to it. It says he feared the crowd. The, the people believed John was a prophet. He seemed like a second Elijah. And there's similarities. Both were rugged men who dressed austerely in camel hair coats with a leather belt and spoke courageously to kings. So Herod kept him safe. He was afraid of John, but he was also fascinated with him. Mark says he used to hear him. John's words perplexed him, but he used to enjoy listening to him as he preached and as he taught. That's, I find, very interesting. The, the message that John preached was repentance for the forgiveness of sin, Herod heard that. He enjoyed listening to him. What John said 
must have rung true in Herod's heart. His, his conscience bore witness to it. He knew he was wrong to have divorced his wife and stolen his brother's wife. And he listened to what John had to say, but it didn't result in conviction, only in fascination, entertainment. Well, John's message, as I said, was repent. It wasn't an angry message. I think people might have the impression as they think about this rugged prophet out there in the desert preaching that he was railing against this wicked king with an angry message. I don't think so at all. It's not an angry message. It was a hopeful message that he gave to Herod. There is forgiveness for all who turn from sin and turn to the Lord. Repent. Herod had no greater friend in the world than John the Baptist. He was calling him off the path to destruction. What better word could one give to another man? What better thing, kinder thing, more loving thing could he do than John the Baptist did for Herod? He was calling him away from certain destruction. Be killing sin, Herod, or it will be killing you. That's what David did when the prophet Nathan pointed his finger at him and said, Thou art the man. He repented of his sin with Bathsheba, and God restored him. Well, this was Herod's opportunity. God, in His grace, gives people opportunity to hear His Word preached. They are given light. They are given opportunity to respond you can never respond to God's Word that it is not a benefit and a great blessing beyond what you ask or think. And this was His opportunity. He gives an opportunity, and then it's gone. Herod's moment came, and he let that moment pass. He refused to repent. He liked listening to John, but he loved his adultery more. He would not kill that sin. Jesus used extreme language to indicate the necessity of dealing decisively with sin. He said, it is better to cut off your hand or your foot or pluck out your eye than be cast into hell. Herod could not, would not, cut off Herodias. And so he became hardened, he became more sensual, he became less enamored of John, his best friend, and then became his murderer. It happened on what Mark calls in verse 23 a strategic day, the day Herod celebrated his birthday. Herod had a birthday party. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, this happened at Machaerus, which was Herod's fortress located in Perea, just east of the Dead Sea. Alfred Edersheim, in his The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, described the ruins of the fortress and the remains of a deep, dark dungeon there in that hot, arid region. It was a horrible place. John was perplexed there and perplexed by the turn of events. We know this from the other Gospels as well. We know from Matthew because there Matthew tells us that he wondered if Jesus was the Christ. And he sent that question to him by his disciples. So there in those difficult circumstances, this great prophet had a crisis of faith. He, he had these doubts. It's not uncommon for the people of God to come into a difficult situation and wonder, where is God? Why is this happening? The, the finest of men go through those periods. And this was the case with John the Baptist. And his disciples brought this concern to our Lord. And the Lord answered, not with a direct answer, but with an indirect answer that was very clear to John. He said, the blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And that last statement in that 
answer that our Lord gave is from Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1. And John understood the meaning of it all. John understood that this is the Messiah. And he remained firm in his faith. But it was put through a difficult test for his faithful service. Maybe that's part of the difficulty. I'm faithful. I'm faithful to all that I've been told to do. And I'm suffering this. Nevertheless, he maintained a firm faith, chained in a deep, dark dungeon without any sign of release. Herod had put him there to keep him safe from his wife, to shut him up, no doubt. He didn't want to hear this message that convicted him and brought his scandal before the world, but it was there to keep him away from his wife. But his wife was a determined woman. She continued to nurse her grudge against John, and she continued looking for an opportunity to end his life. That would come for her in one of Herod's unguarded moments, a careless moment when, like the proverb, he spoke rashly or recklessly and his words became a thrust of a sword. The guest list for the banquet was um, a very uh, auspicious one. It's made up of all the important people of the realm, his lords and military commanders and leading men of Galilee. This was the party he threw. Everyone who was anybody in his realm was there, all important people. Oriental parties often involved entertainment when dancing girls were brought in. On this occasion, Herodias sent her daughter in to entertain the guests. Salome was her name. Mark doesn't give it here, but... That's who she was. She was a daughter from a previous marriage between probably the ages of uh, 14 or 12 or 14. She was young and she danced before the king and she danced before the lords that were there. And it may have been a very sensual dance. Mark doesn't say that, but from Herod's response and uh, that's certainly suggested, and that would certainly fit the morals of the Herods. Whatever she did, it pleased Herod, so much so that he offered a lavish reward. Ask me for whatever you want, and I will give it to you up to half of my kingdom. Wow. Now that was over the top. He was really entertained. But it's more than that. This was an attempt to impress his guests and make him appear to be like some great oriental potentate, like one of the Persian kings of old. It was pride. And again, we have the Proverbs, pride goes before destruction. A, a fool doesn't control his tongue, and it can set the world on fire. That's what James tells us, and this certainly did. Salome was uh, still young enough that she would ask her mother for advice, and when she did, that became the means of Herodias achieving her darkest desires. She seized the moment. She told her daughter what she wanted, and her daughter came back immediately and evidently gleefully and said to Herod's surprise, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The platter seems to have been the girl's own ghoulish idea, a bit of gallows humor. Turned a fun evening into a gruesome one. He had not suspected anything like that, but then that's what often happens. We aren't circumspect about our behavior or what we are thinking or saying. Something comes that we hadn't expected, and that was certainly true here. People aren't careful about where they are, what they do, what they say. Things like this occur. And again, that's the Proverbs. Suddenly, he was caught in a, in a dilemma. Mark says he was very sorry. He regretted his offer. 
But he'd made it, and he'd made it with an oath. He would put his word on the line, and that's where all these people are sitting there. That's what they're thinking, and they're wondering, okay, is he good for his word? They waited to see. Now, the noble thing to do, the only right thing to do was to confess his folly and tell the girl he couldn't grant such a grisly request. But Herod was weak. He didn't have the character to do that. He hadn't been built on the Proverbs. He hadn't grown up with the Word of God. And it shows. He was weak. He was too proud to admit that he was a fool. Certainly not going to admit it before all of these peers and all of these important people of his realm, this, these distinguished guests. So Mark writes, he was unwilling to refuse her. Verse 27, immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded him to bring back his head. And he went and had him beheaded in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl and the girl gave it to her mother. The Proverbs begin, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Then Solomon counsels his son to stay out of the path of the wicked. Herod, as I said, was not a man of the Proverbs. He didn't fear the Lord. He feared men. So he didn't stay off the path of the wicked. That's the path that he was on all of his life. That's the path where he met his wife and she led him to commit murder. Herod, again, hadn't foreseen this. Years earlier he acted out of pleasure and acted for himself. But in rejecting God's path for his own way, one sin led to another and to another and finally to this one. He killed the very man who gave him the way out, who gave him the way off of the path of wickedness, who showed him the way to forgiveness, the way to life. But he would not repent. He would not kill sin. And in the end, sin killed him. The passage ends with John's devoted disciples loving, lovingly gathering his body and burying it in a tomb. Matthew adds that they took the news to Jesus. It was sad news for the Lord. It was a real tragedy. A righteous man, a prophet, had been killed. But it was more than that. It was a sign to him that the same end awaited him. A prophet is without honor. In fact, John's life and end is a model for all of God's saints. Herod's court is, is a model of the world. You want to know what the world is like? Look at Herod's court. Sinful, frivolous, vain, hostile toward God. It's made many martyrs since the time of John. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, we read of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the Word of God. Well, John the Baptist prefigured all of that. Now that doesn't mean that God's people should expect martyrdom. That's rare. But we live in that kind of a world. It's a possibility because that's the kind of world in which we live. It is, it is against the light. We cannot be friends with the world and be friends with Christ. And if we are friends with Christ, if we are loyal to Him, we are going to be at odds with the world. Now that, that may mean a dark dungeon for us. If not literally, then, then figuratively. Family and friends and colleagues at work may respond to us in a way that's very similar to the way Herod responded to John. They, they may not respond well to your life and to your beliefs if you're, if you're standing firm in the faith and if you certainly speak the truth of the gospel to them, they may react in a negative way, a very negative way, a hostile way, and shut you out. 
Well, that's not, that's not a literal dungeon, but it's a kind of dungeon where you're kept away, you're, you're ostracized. That's a possibility, a very distinct one. But what opposes us is not all on the outside. It's not all the world itself. A lot of it is within us as well. In fact, the great enemy we have is the sin within. And we have that. We have to deal with that. We have to deal with that daily. That is life in this present age. And it will be life in this age until we are with the Lord and we see Him face to face. Sinclair Ferguson called the Christian life mortal combat. And it is. And it never lets up. So we can never let up. Do not be conformed to this world, Paul said. Do not ever be conformed to this world. Napoleon wrote to Talleyrand, There is but one step from triumph to downfall. I have seen that some little thing always decides great events. Well, that's true in our spiritual walk. Some little thing, some little failure can decide a great fall. I've been around long enough to have witnessed it in gifted people. Seen those downfalls. Been around long enough to know there but for the grace of God go I. It's all of grace. We stand and fight only by the grace of God. Only by the wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit. Those words, by the way, are attributed to the English reformer John Bradford, who witnessed a prisoner being led off to the gallows, and he said, there but for the grace of God goes John Bradford. By the grace of God, John Bradford was a faithful preacher of God's Word. The result was, like John the Baptist, he was arrested by Queen Mary, put in a dungeon, and then burned at the stake. Before the fire was lit, he turned to the young man chained next to him and said, Be of good comfort, brother, for we shall have a merry supper with the Lord this night. That kind of courage, like John's courage, is a gift of God's grace. It doesn't come to us naturally. But the grace of God comes to us in special ways. The grace of God comes to us through the means of grace that God has provided. And if we want to have that kind of stability, if we want to have that kind of courage, we need to know the Word of God. What it was that gave John courage when he began to, to flag and began to doubt was the Word of God that came from Christ. And he heard it and it strengthened him. And so if we want to be the kind of person that stands firm for the Lord against the pressure of the world and even the threat of death itself, then we need to avail ourselves of the means of grace, which primarily and principally is the Word of God, the knowledge of God's revelation that He's given to us, along with fellowship with the saints and obedience, of course, to all that He has instructed us to do and service to one another. All of this goes together to add to our courage and our strength and our character. That's what keeps us safe and courageous. We are dependent on the Word of God and the Spirit of God to teach us and sanctify us and the good encouragement of one another. The believer in Jesus Christ is infinitely blessed and blessed for eternity. We have been delivered from the penalty of sin and from the power of sin that has been broken in the life of every believer. We can never be lost. That, as you think about it, that should cause you to say hallelujah. But alas, the sin nature is still with us. It will be till we're glorified. It's with us, and with it is this indwelling sin. It's a, it's a principle that is within us, Paul says, a law of sin within us, he says in Romans 7. It's like a snake that's coiled within us, and it's just waiting 
for a false step and then it acts, it springs to life. I read an article yesterday about snakes and about new antitoxins being developed. And there's just something of an urgency about it. It's been neglected, but snake bites kill more than 100,000 people a year worldwide, and they cause all kinds of collateral damage beside that. Well, the article began with a man named John, said, spoke about John, that he stepped over a fence while volunteering at an organic farm. He felt a sharp, burning pain. He'd stepped on a rattlesnake that was five feet long. He collapsed, he foamed at the mouth, he began to suffocate. He was rushed to the hospital, he was put on life support. He was in a coma for a couple of days. He survived, but he will have months of physical therapy. That's how the article began. And then it ended by stating that once John recovers, he's determined to get back to work on the farm. I guarantee you, he said, I will religiously watch every step from now on. Well, that's wise. In fact, watching every step in our walk in terms of comes to snakes is probably as important, if not more so, than, than antitoxins. Just watch where we're going. And that's true of the Christian life. Religiously watch every step from now on. Now, how do we do that? Well, we do that by studying the scriptures. We do that by walking by the Spirit and by killing sin. Now Herod is a different case. His besetting sin didn't frustrate his walk with the Lord. He had no walk with the Lord. He was an unbelieving, unrepentant man. His sin prevented him from coming to the Lord. He's like the rich young ruler in, in that regard, and only in that regard. The rich young ruler was a moral man, a man of integrity, a man that we would admire in a human way. But that rich young ruler loved his money. And he loved the money that he had. He loved his wealth more than the Lord, more than he loved the promise of life that the Lord gave. So, you know the story, he went away grieving because he was very rich. Herod was drawn to John and his message. The, the Word of God intrigued him for a time. But the world and the flesh had such a hold on his soul that he believed their lie. He couldn't let go of what they offered. He's, he's the man in the parable of the soils in chapter 4. The deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter and choke the word. He hears it, he's drawn to it a bit, but Herodias is just too much. She loves him, he loves her too much and he cannot give it up. Herod is uh, an example of lessons out of the Proverbs. Lessons on the danger of moral carelessness. But the great lesson is the failure to fear the Lord. That's the beginning of knowledge. That's how the Proverbs begin. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. And those who reject it, those who reject the fear of the Lord find their feet on the path of the wicked and rather than killing sin, they're being killed by it. In his allegory, the great divorce about a bus ride from hell to heaven, C.S. Lewis gives a scene where he sees a ghost coming toward him with a little red lizard on its shoulder. The lizard is twitching its tail and it's whispering things in the ghost's ear. The ghost is embarrassed and, and tells the lizard to stop, but it doesn't. Then a great fiery angel comes and offers to help. Would you like me to make him quiet? Yes, said the ghost, I would. Then I will kill it. Oh, the ghost said, and, um, he didn't know about that. He, he wanted it quiet, but not dead. It's the only way, the angel said. No, the ghost said, the, the lizard was embarrassing, but killing it wasn't necessary. He would keep it in order. No, the angel said, if he wanted it quiet, he had to kill it. 
Now, so the conversation went. The ghost rationalized keeping the lizard. In fact, the lizard entered into the discussion and it explained, listen, it wouldn't be natural for me not to be a part of you. This is the way we are. This is natural. But the angel persisted till finally the ghost confessed the lizard had to be killed. The angel then grabbed it, threw it to the ground. The ghost screamed in pain. But then something happened. The ghost was transformed into an immense man and the lizard into a great stallion. The man leapt on its back and they galloped off up the hills, up the mountains into what Lewis calls everlasting mourning. What might Herod have become had he repented? Maybe a great king. Certainly a forgiven child of God who would have reigned with Christ forever. Instead, he remained a petty little ruler in a forgotten part of the world. Had an opportunity to talk to Jesus toward the end of all of this. He was intrigued by Jesus. When they met at his trial, the Lord answered none of his questions. Didn't say a word to Herod. The only response Herod got from Christ was deadly silence. No revelation. A few years later, Herod and Herodias fell out of favor with Caesar, who exiled them to Gaul, where they died alone and forgotten. They tried to gain the world and lost everything. Herod had his opportunity. But opportunity doesn't stay. If you're here without Christ, if you haven't believed in Him, recognize you are lost and you need a Savior. Believe in Christ. He receives all who do. This may be your opportunity. Maybe this entertains you. Maybe you're fascinated by things. That's why you come. This is the opportunity to respond to Jesus Christ. Come to Him. Those who do are forgiven forever. They are made sons of God, children of God. They have a glorious inheritance. And in the present, they are guarded by the Lord Jesus Christ as we walk with Him. May God help you to do that and come to Him. And washed our sins away. That's true for every believer in Jesus Christ. Thank you for that. Thank you for the gift that we, we, we receive through faith alone. That, though, is a work of your grace, and we need your grace every moment. Supply your grace to us, Father, as we know you will faithfully. May we be faithful to you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.